Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do encourage you to pick up All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo and All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet, its sequel ebook. In each ebook, I examine the career and history of seven great fictional detectives or policemen, as well as life lessons that can be learned from their uh, cases. They are available as ebooks or as audiobooks through the iTunes or Audible stores. That's all I needed to know I learned from Columbo, or all I needed to know I learned from Dragnet, and you can check out all of my books, ebooks, and audiobooks at the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio store at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Let George Do It. The original air date is September the 20th of 1954, and the title is The Coward. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. Yes, it's Let George Do It. Brought to you by Preem. P-R-E-A-M. The new miracle way to cream your coffee. In a moment, we'll begin tonight's transcribed adventure of George Valentine. But first... Oh, the new way to cream it is to purr it, but get cream. That's cream With a capital P. Whatever you use to cream your coffee now, you'll prefer Preem, P-R-E-A-M. For Preem in instant powdered form, creams coffee deliciously, conveniently, and saves money at the same time. You'll love the rich, creamy flavor of Preem. That's because this new dairy miracle is made from fresh, sweet cream and milk products only. And count on wonderful new convenience. For Preem never sours, never turns. Keeps indefinitely while sealed. Open for everyday use, Preem stays fresh tasting to the last spoonful, whether you keep it on your kitchen shelf or in your refrigerator. And then Preem is thrifty. Saves over one-third on coffee cream costs. What's more, Preem is less fattening. Use Preem in your coffee instead of coffee cream, and you get up to 50% fewer calories. Buy Preem today. P-R-E-A-M. Preem. Get Preem. With a capital P. And now, tonight's adventure of George Valentine, The Coward. Dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Douglas French. I'm staying in a rooming house, 317 River Street. Mr. Valentine, we can't lose a second in correcting the most fearful, the most horrible mistake ever made by a madman. I knew the man, but very briefly, a number of years ago. Some way, somehow, in these years between, the pain of his own suffering must have twisted all his remembrance of fact. Because I hadn't been in this city more than 24 hours when the telegraph office called to read me a wire. It had my name on it. My brand new address. It was from him. Yes, Mr. French, message follows. It says, I have got some new facts. It is never too late for you to suffer as you should. Now I know, and soon the world will know, that I hereby accuse you of cold-bloodedly committing murder for your own cowardly gain. I, I hereby accuse you of murdering a total of 37 people. Signed, Emil Martinez. Emil Martinez. Repeating for confirmation. 37. That is all, Mr. French. I'd say we won't attempt to remove it until the x-rays are developed, Lieutenant. You see, in this quarter of a man's chest... Yeah, yeah, Doc, I know. 
Anyway, maybe the pictures will help us until you do get the bullet. Near the breastbone, huh? With the juncture of this rib, you see. Exactly. No, I'd say the difficult part just now is keeping the poor man alive. All right, Doc. Why so anxious about the bullet, Lieutenant? Do you have a gun to match it with or something? Not yet, but when I do find one... Well, I want to know what I'm looking for. There's nothing concrete to grab onto in this case. Except the telegram, Johnson. Yeah, that. Emil Martinis. We'll round up every Emil Martinis that ever lived. Only I don't know what... Only it was a little wild, wasn't it? Thirty-seven people. Almost a little crazy. Except that we do have a straight-out attempted murder on our hands. Couldn't you find out anything about Mr. French? Comes from the East. They're investigating. They'll let us know. Doesn't look like anything. No past record, no enemies, if that's what you mean. No, no, I meant friends. None here in town. Leastwise, he didn't see anybody we know of. And you found him by the river, huh? Walker, away on the bridge. Landlady said he'd had supper, was pretty nervous, went for a walk to kill time until 8 o'clock. He got it out there in the dark. Noise of traffic on the bridge to cover the shot. Perfect place. Lonesome. Motorists can't see. I guess he'd still be there if one of them hadn't stopped to inspect a flat the tire. Chair. I have the x-ray. Yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, careful, little Lieutenant. Uh, Johnson, speaking of flat tires... You're certainly not going to measure any caliber of anything off that picture. For the... What is it, a picket fence? Yes, yes, beautifully clear, you see. Uh, I'd say a bullet is this little shadow here under the edge of the rib. Yeah, I always get a seat behind a pole. Help us no end when we operate later on. Later on, and I gotta sit around waiting to see if he regains consciousness or dies. Sure, Johnson, in the meantime, the game goes on, doesn't it? What? While you're waiting for that pole to be moved, there's somebody running around who's nutty or wild or crazy. Oh, really, Mr. Ballard, I, I should be in bed today. You know, the telegraph company keeps quite adequate records. It's more than the army. But I've already told them. Oh, excuse me. Bless you. Uh, you. Look, I know there's a file copy of wires to it. Oh, yeah. Yes, and we sent up a confirming copy after we phoned it, naturally. But George, they didn't no. find one on Mr. French or in his room. Yeah, probably threw it away or burned it, Brooksy. No, I'm interested in the file copy at the sending point. But for handwriting? Oh, but it was telephoned in by Mr. Martinez to one of the stations here at the city. The, the city! <laughs> Bless you. Oh. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, you do have to give your phone number and address for charges, don't you? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Well, yes, yes, we've already investigated. Now, wait a minute. I have it. I have it right. Hey, dear. Oh. It was a pay station. Oh. Bless you. Thank you. Do you think penicillin would help? I think maybe we all should have stood in bed. I know, it's discouraging. But we handle so much traffic every day, it's very seldom, you know, anyone would notice the text. Our girls never react to the millions of words they read. <gasps> Good heavens, Miss Johnson, what is it? Mr. Onslow, your message continues. I hereby accuse you of cold-bloodedly murdering 37 people. Signed, Emil Martinez. Do you have that, Mr. Onslow? I'll repeat for confirmation. 37. George, she's fainted. I tell you, I haven't received any wires. I don't know anything about it. We were the in the telegraph office just now when they phoned it to you, Mr. Onslow. I don't know anything about it. I don't know the... F I... All right. I did get it. I'm just a botanist. You understand, Mr. Valentine? A student. Plain Mr. Botan may be. I'm, I'm not concerned with the world of men. Mr. I... Onslow, you were going to say that that wire was a mistake, weren't you? Yes. Yes, it was a horrible mistake. Mm-hmm. That's what Mr. French said about his wire. I'm just a botanist. In the world of botany... I guess you've seen about Mr. French in the newspapers, haven't you? At least from the looks of your study here, all these newspapers. Yes, Mr. Valentine. I know what happened. But that doesn't mean... Okay, then why did it happen? Why the wires? Who is Emil Martinez? What's he talking about? I won't tell you. I'll never as long as I live. Oh, yes, you will, Buster. George, wait a minute. Mr. Onslow, do you always tear up your magazines like that? Huh? There, in the wastebasket. It's a current copy, too. I've never heard of anyone tearing up a... Get away from there! Look out, Brooksy. Put it down! Don't touch it! Don't touch it! Sorry, Professor. No! Uh, you'll be okay, Onslow. Now just sit there. Now then, what do we have to do? Go through the magazine page by page, or are you going to tell us what it is? My world is botany. 
bottom is my world. That's George. All. My world George, is bottom here. Look. look here where it's folded. <laughs> 37. Yeah. Remember, it's here oh. in the article. The freelance writer, J.J. J. Farrell, he's... Farrell. Yes, what? Never mind. What is it? Well, he's talking uh, about the war, about being in Japan. It says, uh, in reference to the above... It is of interest to note that Colonel Suyamoto's dying remarks to me concerned the wiping out of a party of 37, who, with the assistance of native guerrillas, were trying to escape the Holocaust of Singapore. George. Yeah, go on, Angel. In this case, the efficiency of fifth column informants was belied. Colonel Suyamoto stated that the party, which included soldiers as well as civilians, never would have been located had it not been that four members of the party itself were foraging for food at night, and that the application of threats finally made one of the four confess secretly the exact location of the other 37, who regrettably had to be destroyed. Other examples of fifth column, and so on and so on. Hmm. So, I guess the words in that telegram aren't so crazy after all, are they? No. No, Mr. Valentine. Were you one of the four, Mr. Onslow? Yes. Was Emil Martinez? Yes, I, I wouldn't remember any names. Was Douglas French? I don't... Oh, yes, yes, his pictures in the newspapers. It was the same man, I'm sure. All right, who else? But I, I wouldn't remember any names. We, we were all strangers until then. It was just a random group of us and the big party with a few British army men and guerrilla leaders. The others I went foraging with that night, businessmen, perhaps Americans. I know that. I, I was teaching high school botany in Singapore, Mr. Valentine. Botany, I... But afterward, you went through so much together. You were threatened. Maybe tortured, weren't you? We were separated. Later on, sent to different prison camps. The four of us... Why, I never knew just why they stopped torturing us, Mr. Valentine. Why they didn't go ahead and kill us. Mm -hmm. But somehow I just can't believe that you wouldn't remember. A thing so simply told in that article. A thing so unimportant to the rest of the world. To whom the numbers 37 and 4 don't have such awful meaning. And who would guess that we were still alive, any of us? Perhaps many such events took place during the war. It's, it, it's not a thing simply remembered, Mr. Valentine. At least, not with sanity. Among that 37 were friends, were our families. But I have another family now. My work. I'm a botanist. I don't, I don't remember any of it. I'm a botanist. I, I... Okay, Mr. Anzo. I'll talk to you later. I'm just a botanist. A peaceful man. Darling, what are you... <clears throat> Angel, there's a guy giving a lecture tomorrow at the downtown club on the Orient. What? Just ordinary stuff, but the speaker's name is J.J. J. Farrell. J. Oh, the writer. That's why... Yeah, he... everybody seems to be in town at once. I wonder why. And if this whole case has turned out to be a chase after a betrayer, an informer, a coward, then I wonder if the writer wrote all he knew, everything the dying Jap told him about exactly who, which one of the four, was the coward. I tell you, I ain't seen Mr. Farrell. Look, there's a suitcase. That's his, isn't it? You see the stickers? Well, what if it is? I ain't noticed him come in, clean up and dust, and bring in the linen once a week. That's all I do. I'm not a snooper like some people a body has to put up oh, with. Oh, please, take it easy, won't you? We told you how important it was. Brooksy, that... here's his notebook, too. And guess what's on the back page, scribbled in pencil? Hmm? I have some new facts. Hereby accuse you murder of a total of... What's uh, this? What's this? Uh, Auntie, suppose you go into that bedroom and get rid of the laundry or whatever it is you do in there once a week. <laughs> I told you about he had to put up with things. George, those words. Yeah, the words from the telegram. The same identical telegram signed Amo Martinez. Oh! No, stay with it, Brooksy. Oh. 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 
that your tenant, Auntie? No. Is that the writer? No. J.J. Farrell? Oh, I, I, yes. But I didn't see him come in. I, I've been here all day. I, I ain't seen him all day. No. No, I guess you haven't. He looks like he's been dead since yesterday. You know, there's a wonderful new way to cream coffee. It's Preem, P-R-E-A-M. A 100% dairy product in instant powdered form. Once you try Preem, you'll find for delicious flavor, convenience, and economy, you'll prefer it to all other products for creaming your coffee. And say, that's not all. Preem has many other wonderful uses. In cream sauces, for instance, dressing, soup, souffles, and delectable new desserts. Yes, it's a fact. Preem can help you serve your family more delicious meals every day of the year and save money at the same time. There's proof of that in the brand new collection of Preem recipes we're offering you absolutely free. I'm sure you'll be delighted with the wide variety of delicious, quick, and easy-to-prepare Preem recipes in this new booklet. Now, all you have to do to get your copy is drop a card or letter with your name and address to Preem Test Kitchen, Box 959G, Columbus 16, Ohio. That's Preem Test Kitchen, Box 959G, Columbus 16, Ohio. Take advantage of this valuable offer now. Send for your free Preem booklet right away. And now, back to George Valentine. You learn the tragic wartime story of one man out of four who betrayed the location of 37 refugees fleeing from fallen Singapore. Well, if you're anything like George Valentine, you'd like to meet the writer who wrote about that story, particularly when you see that his notebook contains the words of a certain fateful, hate-filled telegram. The only trouble is, the writer is dead. What did the medical examiner say, Johnson? Same as you. Dead 24 hours, maybe. Uh-huh, and his head bashed in. Crime of passion. It was a fight. Struggle. That's a mouthful of understatement, brother. Well, what about Farrell? What kind of a guy was he? I checked with a couple of editors. His reputation's good. Not a chance of his being mixed up with anybody from the Singapore business. And if he'd had any idea those four were still alive, he's the kind of guy probably would have kept his mouth shut. Let sleeping dogs lie. Well, maybe he didn't write all he did know. He couldn't have her. This doesn't make any sense. Ah, uh, sense yet. A guy gets a bullet from home. A guy gets bashed in by whom? It's a killer I want, not... I was reading Farrell's notebook, Lieutenant. His notes and things for stories. And it seems to me you're both counting wrong. What's that, Angel? Well, I mean... Well, look. Here it says, Emil Martinez, question mark. What? Give me that. Oh, wait a minute. And then there's the name Douglas French, his address back east, and Mr. Onslow. Well, that's only three, isn't it? But if I turn the page, I can count to four. Nick Atkins, with a street number here in town. Here, this is the number. Yeah, and this is one time I'm going to do the talking. One time I'm... Hey. Dummy the alley there. Come on, you take it around the lamp. Yeah. Oh, there, there's a policeman. Guy running. I see him now. Brooksy, wait. Those shots were in the alley here. But there's nobody George, here. George, look at the house, the side window. Yeah, broken. Guy was standing out here shooting in it. Side door, Brooksy. Nick Atkins. <laughs> he missed me, didn't he? <laughs> you Atkins? Couldn't hit fish in a rain barrel that way the way he shot at me. Who couldn't? <laughs> hey, don't mind if we get out of this lighted doorway, though, do you? Yeah, yeah, but who? Now, how should I know? Look, Buster, my name's Valentine, and this sure, is... Sure, I read the papers, Valentine. Hi, cutie. Miss Brooks, isn't it? You read the papers, Mr. Atkins. Yeah, I also get around. I watch what's going on. Did you get a telegram? Don't think I'd be left out, do you? Sure, sure. Same stuff, same words. I checked with Frenchy yesterday. You saw Douglas French yesterday? Well, he gave me a ring to say he was in town from back east, that's all. Uh-huh. You seen Onslow lately? Nope. Martinis? Nope. What else did French say? That's all. He was sure in a lather about that wire, though. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, it all strikes you pretty funny, doesn't it? <laughs> you got a better suggestion? <laughs> How else are you going to take this world unless you laugh at it? <laughs> okay, Atkins. Now, look. Get something straight, mister. There was 37 people there. 
I was a boss stevedore at the American docks in Singapore. I was so smart, I thought my wife would be safer with M-37. Oh, I see. Nick, you're, uh, you're not going to help us very much, are you? I don't know. Well, there's one thing I would like to know. Did you have any idea back there in 1942 that any one of the four of you had turned informer? That when they questioned you separately, one of you had been a coward? What do you think? No. None of you even guessed how that tragedy came about until you read Farrell's article in a magazine. <laughs> Otherwise, a certain one of you would never have lasted as long as this. <laughs> All right, stand still, both of you. All right, take it easy, take it easy. I know who it is. Come in, Johnson. There's three cops I'm going to demote, and then I'm going to demote myself. Well, what happened? Did he get away? Ah, uh, don't even ask me. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Relax, Johnson. This is Atkins. <laughs> Has he told you where Martini lives yet? Has he told you what he looks like? So He's can... telling us nothing. <laughs> Everybody's being so cooperative in this case. Well, you can't blame them, Johnson. Of course the coward isn't going to talk. We'll see, we'll see. I'm expecting a call from headquarters. Oh, did they operate on Mr. French for, for the bullet? You could compare it with the ones that were fired at Nick Atkins. No, and... no, not that. It's Emil Martinez, the right Emil Martinez. What are you talking about? You see? People won't tell us. We find out. Hello, Jansen. No. No, Sergeant, you're wrong. You can't be... Uh, yeah? Emil Martinez, who was in Singapore, who was captured and sent along to a Jap prison camp a couple of years later in that same camp, he died of sickness. Well, but... But the telegram... So that's why the question mark after his name. So that's A why... dead man sends telegrams. Today. Yesterday. A dead man phones a telegraph office. Now listen to me, Johnson. Somebody signed his name, that's all. Somebody who wanted to make everybody else sweat. Somebody who'd found out in the article there'd been a coward, but didn't know who it was, was trying to smoke him out. But that's not important, you get me? What I want to do is stop another murder. Another? Well, who's left out of the four? Who fired those shots at Atkins? Who could it be? Get away from me. Both of you. Came right back to your house, didn't you, Mr. Onslow? You can't have my gun. You can't have but it. But you've already shot at Nick Atkins, Mr. Onslow. I missed him. I know I missed him. But you won't get another chance. We're here now, and you're not going to shoot us. Stop talking to me as though I were crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. That's what I'm trying. Right. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him no matter there. what it does. Yeah, that's better, Professor. <laughs> Uh, I don't care what it does, no matter what it does to anybody. All I'm right, we it. know, Mr. Onslow, but still. <laughs> I, I talk about botany. I try to think about botany because I know, I know what a terrible thing killing is, but I can't close my mind. I'm going to kill him. Please, I'm Mr. Going to... Onslow, please be quiet, will you? Why? <laughs> Let him spill it out. You too, Johnson. <laughs> We're making too much noise. I told you I wanted to stop a murder, didn't I? Yeah, but... George! Yeah, Roxy. He's here. I just heard the front door open and... Shh. Wait a minute. Here he comes. All right, get him! All right, all right. All right. Yeah, all right. Come on. Take these in out. Yeah. Okay, okay, get off me. I'm not going any place. Now, Fr get off! Come, Johnson. I haven't got a gun. I don't need a gun. He's clean. Well, all right. I'm sorry we had to be so rough, but sit still. Don't move. Why? You know why. <laughs> Hello, Onslow. Hello, Mr. Atkins. I guess we can do without the formalities. Just take them both down to headquarters. We can check that gun of yours against the bullet in Douglas French, Mr. Onslow. No. <laughs> and you don't have to laugh, Atkins. We'll find a gun of yours someplace. Take it easy, Johnson. I think I'll find the other gun for you. Where? French got his bullet on the walkway of a bridge, right by the railing. Okay. Get some boys dragging that river fast. Killer tossed it over, huh? All right. It's worth a chance. It's worth a lot more than that. I'll say it is, because one of these two guys did it. They're the only ones left. One of those two based in that rider, then later on went out and took a pot shot at French. I guess because French and Farrell and everybody else knew he was the coward, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is funny, isn't it, Atkins? Because you came up here to kill Onslow, didn't you? He's the coward. I don't need a gun. You got no idea what it feels like to know what he did, Valentine. Now, he's the coward, and I'll kill him! Oh, no, you don't. I'll cut it out. I want to talk about telegrams. 
Emil Martinez didn't send them. That's a cinch. And, Mr. Onslow, you didn't even receive your wire until long after Farrell was dead and French had been shot. What difference does that... Therefore, the wires must have been sent by one of you two. And whichever one it was, you sent one to yourself to cover up. So what if I did? Now, what does that make me? Thanks, Atkins. But I don't even care if it was you. The point is, the guy who sent those wires did it because he didn't know who the coward was. Look, mister... So he couldn't have been the coward himself, could he? Huh? Now, wait a minute, Valentine. This case is all upside down, Johnson, because for once the innocent have a tragic motive for wanting to kill. You two guys are at each other's throats because you're the last ones left. Because you jumped to the same conclusions the lieutenant did. <laughs> but, Mr. Valentine, I don't know... Oh, it's pretty easy, Mr. Ronzo. I guess there were two men who knew about the coward. Mr. Farrell and the coward himself, who must have found that Farrell knew the truth and killed him. The man who walked out on the bridge by the railing and tried to commit suicide. Douglas French. Where is Valentine, anyway? He'll be right back, Lieutenant. The doctor said the bullet was right next to his heart. Yeah, I guess it'll match up with the gun from the river, all right. The gun we already traced to French. He must have stood by the railing, concentrated on making his dying movement to heave the gun overboard. And then pull the trigger. Yeah. Douglas French. Only why? Why'd he go to all that trouble? Why'd he call Valentine in, Goat? Think how close to his heart it's always been, Lieutenant. Ever since 1942. Something even more deadly than a bullet. The guilt of knowing what he did. Of being the only one who knew. Yeah, I guess so. And then when the article came out, when he killed Mr. Farrell, he, he must have known it was hopeless. The others would get to him sooner or later. But why call Valentine into it? But don't you understand? He wanted to make everyone think accusing him would be a mistake. Well, it, was, it was like the way he tried to commit suicide. Trying to make it someone else's fault. Mm. Making everything seem someone else's fault. Sure, sure. I get it. Douglas French was a coward all the way to the bit of it. If you'd like to make coffee time at your house more enjoyable than ever, along with your coffee, serve cream. P-R-E-A-M. That's the delicious new dairy miracle in powdered form that creams coffee instantly. And so conveniently, you'll prefer it to all other coffee creaming products. Cream never sours, never turns. Keeps indefinitely while sealed. Open for daily use, cream stays fresh tasting to the last spoonful. Whether you keep it on your kitchen shelf or in your refrigerator. You'll like the new economy cream brings you too. You'll find Prem actually saves more than one-third the cost of coffee cream. And because Prem is made from fresh sweet cream and milk products only, you'll love its rich, delicious flavor. And then, remember this, Prem is less fattening. Use Prem in your coffee, and every cup contains only about half as many calories as if you use coffee cream. So try Prem, P-R-E-A-M. Discover for yourself. The new way to cream it is to cream it. George? Hmm? George, what are you thinking about? Uh, I don't know, Angel. The things people do to forget things, laugh at the world like Nick Atkins, or concentrate on work. <laughs> like botany, maybe. Mm-hmm. We're pretty lucky, Brooksy, you and I. Mm, I know it. Not having anything big to... Well, when we want to forget, all we have to do is... Yes, George? We go out and get something to eat. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you transcribed by Preem, the new dairy miracle in instant powdered form. Try it. You'll prefer it to all other products for creaming your coffee. For Preem is the most delicious, convenient, thrifty way to cream your coffee ever discovered. 
Let George Do It stars Olin Soule as George, and tonight Lillian Bayef appeared as Brooksy. Ken Christie appears as Lieutenant Johnson. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by J.C. Lewis. Also heard in tonight's cast were Jack Edwards as French, Jay Novello as Onslow, Jack Crucian as Atkins, Noreen Gamille as the landlady, and Doris Singleton as the telegraph girl. The music was composed and presented by George Wright, your announcer, George Crow. Join us again next Monday night, same time, same station, when amazing new Prem, P-R-E-A-M, invites you to let George do it. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a madam's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Incredibly well acted. I appreciated, in particular, the performances of the actresses who played the telegraph company operators. It really did convey the horror of what was going on, and Brooksy was clearly moved as well by the tragedy that occurred. And it does deal with a lot of the scars of war and some of what we now come to know as post-traumatic stress and how people dealt with the consequences of war. It was probably in many ways even more timely when uh, Bob Bailey did it because it was a lot closer to when the war occurred. And once again, other than the opening, Olin Sule uh, turns in a really good performance. And I enjoyed these, and I hope you did as well. And we've got quite a bit of... Uh, change coming in the course of the next uh, month on Tuesdays. So, of course, we're going to have The Lone Wolf coming next Tuesday. We only have two weeks of that. And then we have another revisit from a series we thought we'd finished, but a new episode has come into circulation, and I know that has been happening quite a bit. It's really a positive thing, and it makes me hopeful for so many of the series that I am really hoping for lost episodes to come out for, and we have at least three more series uh, that I plan on revisiting within the year with new episodes. I'm kind of staggering them so we get to some of these other programs that I've been wanting to play, but we'll just be playing a single episode of a series that we previously completed. And then after that, it'll be time for Mike Hammer to join the great detectives of old time radio in that hammer guy. So a lot to look forward to in the month ahead. Join us back here tomorrow.